Hey there, welcome to YouTube. If you are into poetry, if you are into literature, if you are into cultural history, then you've come to the right place. Cardboard Box Productions makes podcasts about all those things, so be sure to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Obviously, we mostly make podcasts, so you can also go to anywhere you get your podcasts, if it's a, a place other than YouTube, uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds there. All right, I hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and with my good friend Connor McNamara Stratton, we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare minute of your time, it would mean the world to us if you would give the podcast a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help boost us up the algorithm and find new listeners. And if you have suggestions for future episodes or comments on this one, you can send us an email at closetalkingpoetry at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn. And Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a website, closetalking.com, where you can find all the past episodes of the show, and Cardboard Box Productions has just launched a newsletter, Unboxed, and if you go to cardboardboxproductionsinc.com, you can subscribe for more behind-the-scenes stuff on Close Talking and all of the other literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. On with the show. Welcome to a new episode of Close Talking. I'm one of your co-hosts, Connor McNamara-Stratton. And I am the other co-host, Jack Rossiter-Mumley. And folks, we've got a good one today, as always. But this one is very near and very dear to my heart. It's by Seamus Heaney poem is blackberry picking. It's one of my fave poems, it's a poem I teach a lot. Um, and we were thinking we wanted to do something of a summer poem. You know, I thought, got to go with the berries. Um, but a little bit, he and he, um, he is from Ireland, Northern Ireland, grew up in County Derry. Um, was born in 39 and uh, died in 2013. He won the Nobel Prize in 1995. Um, and he's basically one of the greatest poets uh, around. <laughs> um, but certainly um, since W.B. Yeats, probably the most prominent Irish poet. Um, and and interesting fact, at least at one point, I think in the 2000s, um, two thirds of all poetry books in the United Kingdom were Seamus Heaney's. What? 66%. That's, that's ridiculous. I knew he was popular. That's preposterous. What? Isn't, isn't that insane? That's crazy. Um, that's just too much. Yeah. And it's he's one of those people who's who's popular both with sort of the academics and the critics, but also, um, you know, has mass appeal, as that indicates. Um, and I think this poem is a good example of why. I um, mean, it's from his first collection, his first uh, full collection, Death of a Naturalist, um, which came out in 1966. Do you have anything? I just think it's very fitting that we're doing this for our our episode coming out here in late August. I think it's perfect. I was having some berries yesterday and I was thinking about Heaney. They weren't blackberries, unfortunately, but well, raspberries are okay. So I, I enjoy raspberries more than blackberries. It's less to the point with the poem, but I think it's a better, it's a better taste experience. Raspberries to me are like 
candy, which I love candy, but blackberries got substance. I mean, it's a <laughs> it's a juicy. Well, we should just listen to Heaney talk about it. Yeah, let's have um, him talk about blackberries, and then we can lapse yeah. poetical whatever. <laughs> um, all right, blackberry picking. Late August, given heavy rain and sun for a full week, the blackberries would ripen. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot among others, red, green, hard as a knot. You ate that first one and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. Then red ones inked up and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Round hay fields, corn fields, and potato drills, we trekked and picked until the cans were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, and on top, big dark blobs burned like a plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre. But when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat gray fungus glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented, the sweet flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely candles smelt of rot. Each year, I hoped they'd keep new they would not. So good. Yeah, that's a sweet one. It's a sweet one. Um, I love this poem for many, many, many reasons. Um, but one of the main things that I teach it for, it's one of the first poems that sort of we talk about in depth usually. Um, and it's a good one also for, I found for undergraduates as well as um, I just, actually um, did a lesson with it for middle schoolers. I think there's a way to do it for both. The main sort of concept um, that I think is like very essential um, for all poetry is this distinction between um, sort of what words mean, but then how words feel. Um, the undergraduate way of saying that is denotation and connotation. Um, and this poem is a really great example of sort of strategic connotative language. But basically what happens in the poem is they go out and pick and they have a lot of fun and they think it's going to be great. And then they got too greedy and then they all go bad. And then he's really sad. But that second part of the narrative, that sort of the, the disgusting, sour fermentation fungus is set up in the connotations of many of the images in the first stanza. Um, so, for example, um, the berries are compared to glossy purple clots, like blood clots. Um, the other berries are hard as a knot, which has a kind of stressful feeling. Um, summer's blood was in the berries. Um, there's a lust for them. And then um, this is when it really gets real. Big dark blobs burned like a plate of eyes, which is very creepy. And then their palms become sticky as bluebeards, who's a character in like French fairy tales who basically like locked all of his wives in the basement and murdered them. Um, and like, just like one by one, he would marry someone else and then murder them. Um, so his hands were <laughs> covered in blood. Uh, the blood it's of his wives. It was like a marriage conveyor belt. <laughs> I mean, it really, 
seem that way in the story. Um, yeah, so, but I just think that's, it's interesting because at that point in, in the poem, you don't really sort of know substantially anything that is happening that's bad. They're just enjoying picking berries. Um, but the connotations of those images and similes become increasingly menacing um, and bloody. You know, it escalates to a plate of eyes and Bluebeard, who is a serial wife murderer. Um, and so what I, um, what's interesting to me about that is for undergraduates, I like to say that this is sort of setting up the poem for the reader in an emotional sense, where when you get to the end, when the berries rot, um, you didn't like know it was coming, but you sort of felt it coming. Um, and the reason why you felt it coming is because of the connotations of those images in the first stanza. And when I talk about it with middle schoolers, um, we talk about sort of the other side of the story. Um, and I usually, like I ask them to think of if they've gone berry picking um, or if they have any kind of tradition that they look forward to or whatever, like a Christmas or Thanksgiving or what have you. Um, and then we read the poem, but I've done it, I've cut out all those nasty words and it's like a Mad Libs and then they fill it out. Um, and so they come up with like, their palms are sticky as sap or honey or things like that. Um, but then we throw in those words and they see this darker element to it. Um, and then they, um, I sort of invite them to try to write about some sort of experience they have that has a more complex element to it, another side to the story. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I think that's the main, like, at least the starting point that I use this poem for. Um, but I've just talked for quite some time. So <laughs> I'm really curious what, what you think about it, um, Jack. That's super cool. I love how you use it differently for different ages and it still works so well. That's really cool and speaks to some of the just central strength of this poem. What's interesting to me, and I think part of why this poem is such a classic and can be used in that way is because the reason we talked in our previous episode about, you know, you can notice these kinds of contradictions, but what's the point? Why is this important? Why is it interesting? Um, and I think the reason why it's interesting is because it speaks to the central tension in the act of picking berries, which is that you're killing them. You are taking them from their source of sustenance and using them to sustain yourself. You have put your hunger as the primary need. And a lot of the initial ways in which they are described is as if you're going out and killing like an animal or something animate and, you know, filled a glossy purple clot, like a blood clot filled with summer's blood and you have a lust for it. And that hunger drives you out into the fields to go and collect these corpses essentially um, to the point that you have a plate of eyes with you. And I think there's a lot of different activities that people engage in to bring beauty or to bring sustenance into their lives that have that side to them. You can go flower picking too. You can go apple picking, but the second you pick the apple, the clock's ticking. The second you pick the flower, your bouquet is only going to last so long. And I think speaking to that essential tension, which is in the title, it's blackberry dash picking is the title. The activity that is described in the title is one of violence. It's a benign activity when it is usually done and it's, you know, the purview of laughing, dancing, happy children in a pastoral scene under a late August sun, whatever. But the essential <laughs> act itself is one that contains a great deal of violence in it. And it's bringing out that tension that often goes unexplored in an everyday activity that puts it on the level of other poets who manage to do this. It's something that sometimes Billy Collins does, usually not quite this creepy maybe, but it's something he often does where he takes an everyday situation and kind of blows out the meanings contained within, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that for me was something that I was really appreciating is just that like blackberry picking seen a little bit of skew giving you another angle, as you were saying, the other side of the story 
to such a an everyday activity. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that you bring all of that up. Um, and that, that makes me think of, I don't know if it's like a universal experience, but there's a kind of humanness in in this sort of story that I think applies beyond the berry picking, which is this um, this kind of like excitement that becomes overwhelming to the point of access. Yes. Um, and I think that's like humans are doing that literally all the time. And, it, and it's, I mean, you feel so sad. I, I always feel so sad for the speaker because he's like, I don't know, that part, like I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. And each year I hope they'd keep, knew they would not. There's that cyclicalness too, where it's like, it's not just you did it one time and then they went bad. It's like every year you pick way too many berries and they go bad because you can't eat all the berries. Um, and that and, kind of, yeah. Well, yeah. What are you going to say? I was just going to say you forget year to year. And that's so the case with like every tradition. You forget how quickly your Christmas tree dies or you forget how fast the candles in your menorah burn. You know, every year you expect it to last longer or you expect a different outcome. And then you realize a new every year. Oh, that's right. Every time we always fill the cans with the berries. We have to fill them. We get so excited and carried away in the joy of summer and the fun that we're having together and just imagining all the different things we could make with these beautiful berries. And now they're rotting again. Ah, just like they did last year and the year before that and you're the poor for that. And ah, man, I was really hoping this would be different, but like, is it again, it's like pointing to a very universal experience that I think we all have in different ways, not necessarily around picking blackberries, but like, I think we all feel that, or like you forget just how hot and humid summer can get, or you forget how quickly the leaves change color. It's yeah. It's just yeah. long enough for you to not quite remember. Year yeah. To year. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, this is like a, a very dissolute example, but lots of people drink too much and then they get hung over and then the next night they're like, I'm really going to keep it chill tonight. <laughs> and then they're like, I'm feeling it. I feel good. And then the next morning they're just an idiot. Um, <laughs> the next morning, I'm like, ah, there's mold on my blackberries again. <laughs> <laughs> they fermented into a sweet wine. Heck yeah. Where's um, my blackberry wine? <laughs> <laughs> I want to get moldy tonight. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that I have not heard at a party. Uh, well, clearly, you need to go to more parties with Shimasini. That's true. Um, but yeah, I, I just think there's that that kind of getting swept up in a moment um, and that excess that you know is going to go bad. Um, I don't know. Just It just sort of hits at that chord, I think, really well. Um, and also, I was just noticing the voice is so nice at the end. It just, it, like, you know, it's a child's memory. Um, and I feel like he really kind of inhabits, the voice sort of becomes more childlike at the very end. The, it wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. I just feel like that, like it wasn't fair um, it's just like not what the, the Seamus Heaney adult writing the poem would say, but what the Seamus Heaney kid was thinking. Um, and that's like a nice sort of texture, I think, to drop, drop the age register in the poem. Yes, because it does feel like a child is the one speaking, even though there are perhaps references that go beyond what most children would think of, or there are words used that might be, would indicate a child older than the one I think you imagine when you read the poem. It's, it very much feels like it's a child's voice coming through or a childhood experience. Yeah. Although, I mean, I do think that it's, it, it modulates a little bit at the end. Like, I don't think a kid would ever say late August, given heavy rain and sun, you know? Um, and so I think, I don't know how to describe it, but there's sort of um, 
it's in a way similar. This I wish we had the poem on hand, but Elizabeth Bishop's poem in the waiting room, um, which we should maybe talk about on a different episode, is a great poem about kind of like discovering one's identity and the speaker is kind of a kid with her aunt in a dentist office or something. And there's moments that sound like the most sort of, you know, immortal poet speak of all time. And then there's moments that are like, my aunt's like sort of annoying kind of thing. And like, that's just like a, what a kid would say. Um, and, and so I think there's this, um, this subtle way that poets when sort of often uh, modulate the voice um, so that you sort of like step more directly into the experience of, of the, the speaker as a child or something. Definitely. Should... Yeah. Cause it feels, I guess what I, what I'm getting at is that it feels like someone reflecting on their childhood in a way that puts you there with them as the child, but you still feel like you're being told the story by the adult version of that child. Um, but the subjectivity of the child is rendered strongly enough that you still feel like you're getting an experience that is not just what you're being told, but also you feel like you're being put into the, into the experience of the person who's telling you at that young age. Yeah. No, I agree with that completely. Um, Cause I also don't think most children would say where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. <laughs> Probably seems not. a little more consciously poetical. Yeah. That's also such a good line. Every time I read that, I'm like, yes, it sounds <laughs> so good. I really recommend everyone read that at least that one line where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots i mean the sounds are so good so yeah. there's the bees in the briar then there's the r in the briar the scratch has the r it's got an s it's got the ch which then comes back and it has the a that then comes back in the grass with also the r and then s and then bleached has the B R the B from the briar, the ch from the scratched, um, and then our boots has um, the B again, um, and, and the R from briar in our. Yes, and the hour and the R from briar, um, and it ends on that nice boots got kind of like that low U sound, uh, and also um, bleached our boots is a nice little three word, even tighter sounding phrase at the end of a whole line that's essentially sonically talking to itself. And I think that's like one of the, I've been on a real uh, Heaney kick, but um, I think one of the things that he does really well, um, because this poem is like actually quite formal. Um, there's end rhyme, like half end rhyme, couplets basically for the whole poem um so given heavy rain and sun blackberries would ripen half clot not flesh was sweet summer's blood was in it lust for picking hunger pots boots drills full covered burned peppered bluebeards um cash bush sour rot not etc um Buyer so there's a fur buyer for um so it's it's not always exact but that level of formality often is sort of thought of as a like a relic of the past in like a sort of shakespeare thing where you know it's like ancient verse or something um and certainly if you do it poorly that is what it sounds like but i feel like one thing that seamus heaney does really well is is these kind of really tight sonically dense poems that also sound like you could just say it naturally. Um, like all together, it feels like a poem, but like wet grass bleached our boots isn't like a crazy thing to say, you know? Um, our hands were peppered with thorn pricks. It's just somebody speaking a little bit differently than they might to say like, oh, we got a bunch of thorns on our hands. You could still say our hands are peppered with thorn pricks. It would be a little bit of a poetical way to speak, but it, as you're saying, it wouldn't be 
outlandish. It would be ridiculous. Somebody could absolutely say that. Exactly. And and there's no words that are like words that you would never see. Um, like it was, I was reading a separate Heaney poem where he used the word crep, crepuscular, uh, which is like of the night or something, twilight or something. Yeah. Which, it's a great word, and I've literally never, ever heard it in my entire life. Um, it's like a word only reserved for poetry. Um, but here, I feel like he finds the sounds inherent to just everyday language. Um, you know, hay fields, cornfields, potato drills, tracked. There's also these great internal rhymes. Um, we tracked and picked until the cans were full. Um, you know, uh, you know, the fields returning again, uh, stains upon the tongue with those ends. Um, but most of these words, you know, would be just totally normal, I think, in, in almost any context. Um, and yeah, I just, I feel like that is a feat that if you can pull off I mean, you're just golden. Um, it's incredible because it feels like the language is much more heightened than it is. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of that is because it's all so tightly connected sonically. It feels like more is going on on the word to word level than actually is going on because the words are so linked to each other. But then when you break it down, even the, the line that we were talking about where Briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. It seems much more complicated when you read through the poem, that line, than it actually is. It's really pretty basic. Scratched is the longest, scratched and bleached are the longest words in that, and they're both super straightforward words. Yeah, the only hard part is like for us Americans who like would say a bush rather than a briar. Yeah. But, um, or a, a buyer it rather than a shed. You know, right. um, but, that, but that's just idioms or, you know, um, yeah, I agree. It's just so good. I also uh, like that in the second part when he's talking about the fungus, it's a rat gray fungus glutting on our cash. Um, number one, glutting on our cash is a great <laughs> phrase. Um, but also it sort of goes back to the way he describes the desire in the pickers because that is this like unnameable hunger and hunger and gluttony are obviously closely related. And the idea that the drive that the individuals who go out to pick the berries, who pick these bushes bare is the same natural drive that is within an, a, a, a less conscious perhaps fungus that just has a drive to move through these berries and consume them glutting on the cash as it were. Um, I liked that connection because the fungus is hungry too. It's a hungry fungus. It's a, a hungry fungus, fungus, if you will. It's a hungus. It's a hungus. Um, that's, that's right. <laughs> but the just the idea that it makes the pickers and their urge to pick, which could just be this sort of murderous aberration, it just makes it a different manifestation of a natural drive towards a certain kind of destruction for sustenance. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Right. And it's like a uh, tit for tat kind of thing. It's like, you're being greedy. Now the fungus is going to be greedy. So suck on it. Basically, <laughs> basically Seamus Heaney is encouraging everyone to suck the fungus. <laughs> um, um, His little known poetry collection, Fungus Sucker. <laughs> oh, man. I do also, um, I studied abroad in England. I was very lucky and I took an Irish literature class and we had an Irish professor um, who was incredible. And we read some Heaney and we read this. Um, and one thing that he pointed out was that there's also a kind of sonic shift that happens in the stanzas, I feel like I'm forgetting some of it, but 
there's a lot more bees in the first stanza where you have the blackberries, but then you have briars and bleached in boots and tinkling bottom, big dark blobs burned, um, blue beards, etc. cetera. Um, and there are some bees in there, but the big words kind of, there's a bunch of Fs yes. that come in um, that pretty aggressively too. So um, we hoarded the yeah. fresh berry. Yeah. And the bath was filled. We found a fur, a rat gray fungus. Um, the fruit fermented. The sweet flesh would turn sour. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. And I, I think there's also like, I think um, there's some eh, like an eh sound, like flesh, felt, smelt, fermented, that sort of comes in in the second. Um, and I wish I could do a more sort of like thorough analysis of that. But I think the Bs and the Fs give a good sense that there's a sort of a tonal, you will notice a t like a, there's a sonic change that you'll notice even if you don't notice it, basically. Um, and that's like another subtle way that Heaney is kind of priming us um, for the narrative turn that happens. Um, the sort of sonic turn works with the narrative turn. And the sonic turn also tracks the concerns. So the first stanza is mostly about picking blackberries, which is a B. And the second stanza is mostly about the fungus, an F. And so the switch from blackberries to fungus also tracks with the switch from B sounds to F sounds. And there are lots of P's too, which are kind of like B's. Uh, purple clot, uh, picking, P tins, jam pots, potato drills, trekked and picked. So... Play device. Play device, thorn pricks, palms. It's pretty peppered. A lot. <laughs> it's a lot. There's a lot going on uh, in this. Like when I think you, yeah, when I talk about it like that, I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is overwhelming. But <laughs> when you read it, you're just like, oh, like poor kid. I don't know. Um, it's just so naturally done. It's, a, it's another example of um, the way that the formal structure is subtle and quiet and helps the thematic um, and the content, um, but without like drawing attention to itself, um, which I think we had talked about the sort of loud form of the Harjo, um, the sort of Gwendolyn Brooks form. And then we talked about my brother at 3 a.m., which was a pantoum. So it's a more strict form um, but that was like sort of another example of, of a quieter um, form um, for, but that still sort of was doing the work of the content. And I think this is an even quieter form because it's not like lines aren't repeating. It's sort of happening at the very small levels of sound. But I think that it's a good, it's like just sort of loud enough that you can note, you can, if you, step back and think about it, you can notice it. And so it's a good poem to analyze how it works. But I think even in a much looser, um, you know, free verse type thing, if it's good, I still think that there will be those kinds of sounds uh, and like rhythmic formal patterns that are, that are aiding the content, um, even if, your ear doesn't sort of like consciously pick up on it. Definitely. And it also speaks to the reason that as a poet, you want to do a lot of these things. Because a lot of times it can just feel like, oh, it's supposed to be poetic. I'm supposed to make sounds that go together. I'm supposed to do this and that to make it sound really good and to like, you know, make this more poetical. But this poem points to how when you do that really well and really intentionally with a clear motive in mind, you can both aid in making the poem more accessible and easier because it's operating on a level where you don't have to analyze all of the specific things going on to just feel what's happening because the sounds are so tight. 
you get a better feeling for what the poet is trying to get across here. But also, it adds all of these other layers to it. So it aids you in your surface level initial reading to just get a sense of what's going on. But then as you dig into it, there's also more to uncover. Uh, and it really points to the, for me at least, to why doing the sometimes talked about in a somewhat cliched way stuff of poetics, there's actually like a lot of purpose to it. And it is a reaffirmation of that purpose of just like the mechanics that go into poetry. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I'm trying to think. Do you have any other thoughts on <laughs> Seamus? <laughs> I mean, I love this poem. What I think people like Seamus Heaney or Billy Collins or maybe Mary Oliver or other like poets who sort of manage to enter the popular bloodstream in a more profound way. But what they do is they bring poetry to a broader audience that can start their journey towards becoming poetry readers in a very, usually a very accessible way. Yeah. And I think that's right. And I would say what separates Heaney from all of them, I think, um, is that you can start and then just keep going. And Heaney has a depth, I think, that none of those poets do. Yeah, um, he gets real crepuscular. He gets very crepuscular. Um. So... Yeah, no, I, but I think that I think that's a good point. Uh, we didn't have time, and Blackberry Picking doesn't have it, but his sort of um, political life is very interesting um, because he was uh, sort of growing up during the Troubles in Ireland, and he was Catholic, um, which was complicated for reasons that I barely understand. Um, but at any rate. He, in his poetry, was trying to, I think, often speak to both the Irish and the English, but then also the Northern Irish and then the Southern Irish. Um, and in a way, um, there's, there's a poem that's called, Whatever You Say, Say Nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I don't know, it, it's interesting, but his, I don't know, his trajectory is very complicated and, and he kind of um, was, was an incredibly diplomatic um, person, both in his poetry and in his sort of like public life. Um, but also in a way, I think that, I mean, probably some people criticized him but in a way, you know, that didn't come across as like, um, like being two-faced or being empty. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that is a really important part of his legacy. Um, it was back in April, it was the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Accords, uh, which was the, the peace deal. Right now, because of Brexit, there are increased tensions around the question of how Northern Ireland relates to Ireland, because along with Brexit, there's the question of whether there will be a hard border between the two now. And so all sorts of old tensions have been inflamed. Um, but it was a Seamus Heaney poem that a lot of people were circulating as a way to celebrate and commemorate the 20th anniversary of those accords. Um, so I think that that really is a big part of his legacy, his deep connection to Ireland and Northern Ireland, and also the place he occupies in that connection, which is one of uh, sort of bridging a divide in many ways through his art, which is a very special thing. Yeah, we'll have to link that poem. Um, Definitely. Should we read it again? I think we should. All right. Blackberry picking. Late August given heavy rain and sun for a full week, the blackberries would ripen. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot, among others, red, green, hard as a knot. You ate that first one and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, 
leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. Then red ones inked up and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Round hay fields, corn fields, and potato drills, we trekked and picked until the cans were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, and on top, big dark blobs burned like a plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre, but when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat gray fungus glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented, the sweet flesh returned sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. This is co-host Jack Roster Munley. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. Five stars, maybe? Those reviews help with the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. And you can put anything in them. You can write whatever you want. You can just say, oh, this is a good podcast. I like this podcast. You could be like, hey, that Connor guy, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, Jack, why is he doing this outro so long? You know, get him off the mic. Whatever you feel like writing, head on over there. Five stars drop in the review uh do you have thoughts about this poem is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode well we'd love to hear from you and there are tons of ways that you can get in touch with us i mean i guess you could drop it into an itunes review you could be like five stars hey why don't you talk about insert name of poet here um but you can also send us an email that's probably the best way to do it close talking poetry at gmail.com is our email address or you can find us on twitter i am at jack rossiter munn connor is at connor m stratton and the show is at close talking on instagram you can find us there too uh we are at close talking poetry and we are on facebook at facebook.com slash close talking we haven't gotten to tiktok yet and we might never who knows anything is anything is possible um, speaking of all those social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China, who keeps us active across the internet. And a thank you to all of you for listening. We will see you next time. <laughs>